I'd like to start the message today with a little game. And so this requires a little participation on your part. So hopefully you're awake at this time. You're, well, you need to answer some questions. All my questions have to do with uh, the likelihood of how people die. Okay? Uh, a little morbid subject, but I think we'll have some fun with it. Okay? So the first question uh, is right up here on the screen. Would you uh, more likely to, be di to die? Would you be more likely to die from a car crash or a stroke? How many of you say car crash? All right. How many of you say stroke? And the answer is stroke. So sorry. There are over a hundred thousand people who die of stroke every single year, whereas car crashes were more in the three thousand people range. Okay. Question number two. How about this one? Would you be more likely to die from fire or water? How many of you say fire? All right. How many of you say water? All right. You can put your hands down. The answer is water. Actually, uh, your odds of drowning are only about one in a thousand. So um, I read this study and it showed that uh, men drown more than women. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why that is. I think we're a little bit more reckless, so nice job, guys, on that one. Uh, next question, question number three is this. Are you more likely to die from a tornado or lightning? How many of you say tornado? All right, how many of you say lightning? All right, we just kind of split decision here. The answer is tornado. Uh, the odds of you being struck by lightning are extremely thin. I was looking up th that this week on the CDC. I found out you're more likely to die from a falling coconut than you are of uh, being struck by lightning. I'm not even kidding around. So when there's a thunderstorm out there, breathe out, man. It's going to be okay. But if you're walking under a coconut tree, I'm just saying, 150 people die every year from coconuts. Did you know that? Those, the, the 80 feet drop, the thing, you know. Anyway, next question. I'm digressing here. Would you be more likely to die from uh, dogs or bees? How many of you say dogs? How many of you say bees? Okay, you guys are getting pretty good at this. Bees uh, win this by a very slim margin. In 2014, there was 42 fatalities from dog bites, uh, whereas allergic reactions to a bee sting claimed 53 lives last year. So it was, you know, pretty darn close. The interesting thing is a lot more uh, dogs die from bees than bees die from dogs. But that's, that's a whole other story, okay? <laughs> Last question, here we go. Are you more likely to die from uh, sharks or snakes? How many of you say sharks? How many of you say snakes? Wow, I think that's unanimous, and you are correct. Despite those fears you have wading in the ocean at Seaside Heights, it is highly unlikely that a shark will even mess with you. Only 40 people a year average die from sharks, whereas snake bites kill an estimated 25,000 people every single year, which proves the point that I'm trying to introduce to you this morning, and that point is just simply three words. It's right here. Ready? I hate Snakes. I hate snakes. This is why. I've had some encounters with snakes in my life, even from when I was a little boy. I remember my dad trying to throw this rock at a snake. I was terrified. There was other things in my life with snakes. I was trying to cross this little creek and play down there in the woods, and there was a snake coiled up right next to me. Ah! I screamed, and we got out of there. I remember this uh, snake dream I've had since I was a little boy. I keep having this recurring snake dream. It bothers me. And uh, snakes show up sometimes in my in-laws' houses. They have a lot of property, and I, I just hate those things. One time, I was speaking uh, in a group, uh, you know, maybe Maybe a little bit larger than this at a school down in South Texas and as the students were dismissed I was sitting there eating my lunch on break and I noticed in the back of the auditorium there was a snake back there inside the building so I took a shovel that was nearby cut the thing in half and I have a vengeance personal thing against snakes I hate them nasty slithering evil creatures Indiana Jones was right they are cursed by God now, how many of you in here, you agree with me? Who are our snake haters? Who hates snakes in the audience? Very good. You put your hands down. Anybody love snakes in the audience? Snake lovers here? Too? There's a couple of you. There's always a few. Let me ask you one question. What is wrong with you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you're brave. That's what I can say right there. But whether you love snakes or whether you hate snakes, that's actually what we're going to be talking about today. Did you know that the snake is one of the most symbolic uh, animals in the ancient Near East and uh, significant throughout the scriptures. It plays an important role in the Bible. Uh, I mean, you know, who could forget that uh, that story about Mary riding to Bethlehem on the snake? Or uh, you remember that one about how 
uh, the guy had a hundred snakes and he lost one and he left the 99 to go find the one. Now, do you remember that story about Noah when he sent the snake out of the ark to go find the olive branch? Remember that? Now, none of those stories have snakes. The reason is because the snake is not a very nice creature in the Bible. The snake rep- represents evil. The snake represents uh, Satan. The snake represents sin and temptation and God's judgment and God's punishment. However, uh, did you know that the snake also represents healing and salvation? In fact, all across the world, on medical buildings and hospitals everywhere, you'll notice this one particular insignia of a snake wrapped around a pole. It is a universal symbol of healing. Now, why is that? A snake? How could that be? And how did that come to be? Well, there's a variety of different ancient sources for that. The primary one comes from Greek mythology, where there was one of the gods who uh, was a god of medicine, and he used to carry around this pole with a snake on it. But many people believe that this symbol was older even than that Greek myth. Many scholars believe that this symbol goes way back to the Bible, uh, to a story about the symbol of a snake that was associated with physical healing. Now, how could that be? That's a good question. That's what the passage is about today. I encourage you to turn to John chapter 3. Uh, the subject of this passage is saving faith. What is saving faith? It's probably the most famous passage in the Bible. I bet many of you have John 3.16 memorized since probably you were a little kid. Many of you could probably quote it to me right now. But what you have to understand is John 3.16 fits in a very particular context And today I want you to understand the richness of that context because it can't be fully grasped without all of that which comes around it. So we pick up the passage where we left off last week. Jesus was having a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. Remember that? Well, here today, he continues that conversation. And if you're ready to continue with me, say amen. Amen. 11. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you, Nicodemus, do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Let's pause right there. This is a remarkable claim that Jesus is making, not only with the term Son of Man, which was a term in the book of Daniel that referred to Him as a deity, but here we see one of the unique features in the Gospel of John, and that's when Jesus prefaces His statements with this phrase, truly, truly. Do you see that? The old King James said it this way, verily, verily, I say unto you. The Hebrew word there is the word amen, or they pronounced it amen. Amen, amen, I say to you. And the way you translate that word is just, it is true. It is a way of affirming the truthfulness of the statement of another person. You see, back then, Jesus had a unique claim to authority. Uh, The other scriptures tell us that when Jesus taught, He spoke as one who had authority, and they were amazed at the way He taught. In fact, He would say things that nobody else would say. Back then, they would speak on the authority of other rabbis. The teachers would say, I speak on the authority of Shimei, who spoke on the authority of Eliezer, who spoke on the authority of so-and-so. Quote, Jesus doesn't talk like that. Jesus says things like, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Now, nobody had the audacity to talk like Jesus talked, and it amazed people. And when he talked like this, scholars across the board recognized that nobody else uses the word amen like Jesus uses the word before he starts talking. Back then, the word amen was used just like it is today to affirm the words of another person. They'd be teaching in the synagogue. You agree with the rabbi? Say amen. Amen. But nobody used it before they started speaking. And by doing this, what Jesus is doing is He's taking away your right to decide whether you agree with what He says is true or not. Before He starts talking. It's not about whether you like what He says or not. It is true. Deal with it. And so here Jesus' use of amen is, is one which points to His authority. And now what that means for you and I is this. We need to take the words of our Lord very, very seriously. Very seriously. Jesus is explaining here the details about eternal salvation. What could be more important than this? We need to listen to Him. Who would know better than Him? So that's the first point on your outline. We need to listen. 
That's part one of saving faith. We have to listen. I mean, Nicodemus, this is not secondhand information, my friend. It's not like I heard this at school, Jesus says. It's not like I heard this from some prophet. I'm speaking to you what I eternally know and what I eternally understand. It's first-hand information. I did not learn this. I was not taught this. I, I did not read this. I did not receive this. I have eternally known everything about salvation that I am telling you. Nicodemus, listen to me. We need to listen. Can I be honest? We as a culture are not that great at listening anymore. I think we have so many distractions in our lives, more than ever, that we've just trained ourselves not to listen, uh, probably more than ever. I heard a funny story. He went to go see his pastor uh, for marriage counseling. And he said, you know, pastor, my wife says I need marriage counseling. And he said, well, why would your wife say that? Why do you think she says that? And uh, he said, well, here's the thing. Um, I believe she said I don't listen to her. At least I think that's what she said. <laughs> but I'm not really sure. <laughs> Friends, we need to listen. Uh, Psalm 81, God says this, Oh, that my people would listen to me. Jesus said it this way, Let these words sink down into your ears. Let me encourage you, because I'm going to just go off the sermon for a second. On Sunday mornings, this is a special time for you to listen to the Word of God. It's a, it's a time, let me encourage you not to let anything distract you. Uh, if, you can, if you can, please stay awake during the sermon. If you can, that's a, a minimum, okay? But try not to go to the restroom if you don't have to. Try to just be present for this you know, 30, 40 minute time of listening to God's Word. Now, I'm not saying this because I want you to listen to me. That's not the thing. The thing is, you need to listen to God's Word. It's for you. And some people say, well, some pastors are so boring. And I understand that. Sometimes I can be boring. I get that. You know what I'm saying? But the thing is, you know what ought to hold your attention? The Word of God. That is sufficient to hold your attention. This is the time where we hear from God's Word. But nowadays, sometimes people are like, oh man, that sermon was too long, or the, you know, the shorter the better kind of thing. Listen, you don't need to hear from a preacher every week. You don't need to hear from a poet every week. You don't need to watch that favorite show of yours every week. But what you do need every single week is to hear from the Word of God. That's where the power is. That's what your soul thirsts for. So I encourage you to listen. One time in his ministry, Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, and the voice came from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. Listen. If you're listening, say amen. amen. Let's go on. He says this in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Up, so that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. What in the world does this mean? I can imagine thousands of questions racing across Nicodemus' mind. What are you saying, Jesus? Are you the bronze serpent? What are you saying about me? Are you saying that I've been somehow infected with some invisible venom that I'm not aware of? What exactly are you trying to explain? And to understand what these questions are all about, we have to go all the way back to a story in the Old Testament that shows up in Numbers chapter 21. I've written it there in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along. Here's the context. In Numbers chapter 21, this is after the Exodus has taken place. During the season of wandering. But here we are now, it's about 40 years later, and the previous generation has passed away. And now this next generation is right on the cusp of entering into the promised land. They are so close. And we pick it up with verse 4. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient along the way. So here's what happened. Moses did not want to do battle against the people of Edom. He tried to negotiate with them. It did not work out. And Moses knew to fight against them and go through their territory would be disastrous. And so he found an unpopular but wise way to go around them. Instead of to the north and to the west, he decided to take the people to the south and to the east. Now that was way out of the way and they were frustrated. Just like you get frustrated if there's a detour on your way home from work. Oh man, I usually go this way. It's a lot quicker. Now I've got to go all the way around Robin Hood's barn. And every single person in the children of Israel was annoyed at the fact that this was going to take longer. And so they started complaining. And they started grumbling. I know it's hard to imagine. God's people start complaining and grumbling. 
Verse 5 it says, They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt? To die in the wilderness? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Now the food that they detested was called manna. And it was a supernatural food that God had provided from heaven every single morning. It was this sweet flour-like mixture that they could make cakes out of and everything. And it was really their lifeline there in the desert. They would have nothing else had it not been for God and His provision of manna. But they had eaten manna for a long time. Forty years is a long time of the same type of food. And so they started grumbling. They're sick of it. And they started complaining. And as a result, God sent them a punishment. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. Some translations say venomous, some say poisonous. Yours might even say fiery snakes. They were called that, not because the snakes were on fire. They were called that because they set you on fire. A, bit from one of, a bite from one of these adders in the ancient Near East uh, would cause uh, not only the poison to go in, into your body, but right where it went in, there would be this fiery, hot uh, swelling that would take place immediately. Uh, following that, you would encounter a raging fever, and the symptoms you would have would be an insatiable thirst in addition to all the pain. And finally, it would end in your death. Tragic story. I was just thinking, can you imagine being there? Here I am, I'm a father. I got three girls. Imagine one of my girls gets bitten by one of these fiery serpents. And subsequently I saw she's poisoned, she's in pain, and now she's dying. Come on guys, you have, you have kids. Those of you who have little ones, imagine just imagine, there's one of your kids writhing in pain. Maybe her mom's holding her. Can you imagine the confusion? Can you imagine the anger? Can you imagine the, just the hopelessness that you would feel in that moment? The, the, just, what a scene. And as the dad, what would you do? You're so helpless there out in the middle of the desert. There's not like a clinic you can go check into. There's not like, you know, St. Elizabeth down, down the highway. No, you're helpless. And your daughter's dying. And the only thing that you could think to do, the right thing that you would do, is you would repent and you would plead with God to have mercy on you and your family. And that's exactly how many people responded. They were desperate. Look at verse 7. Uh, the people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. You see that? They're frantic. So they go straight to Moses, many of them. Moses, please, please. Please, I beg, I beg you, please plead with God for us on behalf of us. Pray for us. Tell God we're sorry for complaining. Ask Him to take these fiery snakes away. Ask Him to take the sickness away. Ask Him for a cure. Ask Him for deliverance. Ask Him for salvation. Because my baby girl's dying. Moses, if you don't do something, my baby girl's going to die. She's going to perish. Please, Moses, I'm desperate. We're desperate. You've got to help us. And that's when Moses one of the greatest intercessors in the whole Bible goes before the Lord. It says, so Moses prayed for the people. So Moses prayed for the people. And as he comes before God Almighty once again on behalf of this stubborn group of people, once again in His mercy, God hears his prayer because the scripture says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And some of you have been praying for things for many, many years. And I want to encourage you to be persistent and to keep on praying. And Moses prayed here and God answered and God gave him a, a very strange set of instructions. Take a look at verse 8. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who's bitten can look at it and live. Wait, what? Friends, this is the weirdest, most enigmatic possible remedy I could think of for this sickness. I mean, can you imagine? You want me to do what now? You want me to make a huge image of the thing that's killing everybody? Make a big bronze serpent, put it high on a pole, and tell the people to look at it? For what? What good would this thing do? How's that going to help anything? And can you imagine when Moses tells the people some of their reaction? Moses, my baby girl's dying here. I don't think you understood what I was saying. This is all you got? I need a cure. I need some medicine. Yep, this is what God said to do. So you go back home. And imagine you, you have to explain to your wife. Well, I talked to Moses. This is what he said. He said there's a snake on a pole. 
you're wondering what this is all about, and the two of you guys are just shaking your head. But then just, just imagine your little daughter is in the tent next door. And she overheard you explaining these instructions to your wife. With the faith of a little child, she goes, Dad? Dad? You know that voice in the middle of the night, Dad's? Dad? Yes, honey? Dad, I heard what God said. I heard what you just said. Dad, help me. Dad, I, I want to go. Could you just pick me up? Could you just bring me there so I can see that thing? Take me to that pole. Just turn my head towards it because I know if I can just see it, God will heal me. I believe. Unless you become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So with childlike faith, imagine you go and you take her and you bring your little girl in desperation and, and you take her to that place and then when you finally arrive, her little face looks at that bronze serpent and she just stares at it and she looks and she looks and she looks and after that look of faith, you stand there as amazed as you can be because her muscles are relaxing all of a sudden because now strength is coming back into her body. Now she's enveloped by a new invigoration and you realize, I, I can't even believe it, she's going to be okay. She's going to live. She's going to live. She's going to live. Verse 9. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. All that was required for you to be healed was a look of faith. A look of faith. To look and to believe that God could bring healing. To look and believe the Word of God that there is life. There is forgiveness for my sins. There is second chances after I rebel against God. And to have saving faith, that's point number two. We must look. We must first listen, but then we must also look. Now you might say, well, Pastor Dave, that seems easy, right? Why? What do you mean just look? Well, to look here, you have to understand, is much more than just an act of your, your eyelids. To look here means you are now recognizing God's authoritative word over your life again. To look here was a look filled with faith. To look here means you are going to take God at His word again. To look right here means you're going to bow the knee again before the sovereignty of God. To look at that bronze serpent with faith means you are now going to yield and submit your life to God. To look was to trust and obey. But most of all, to look was to humble myself and to realize the cure does not come from within. I must look for a cure outside of myself. All of that wrapped up in look. Story so awesome on so many different levels. I mean, on the physical level. You're like, whoa, our God heals. Our God is powerful. Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord who heals you of all your diseases. Like, wow, right? Then on a spiritual level. Wow, our God is merciful. Compassionate. Our God is a God of second chances. He forgives our sins. Just like He said, the Lord is gracious, compassionate. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse us, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love towards those who fear Him. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. Amen. The Lord is a gracious God. Now, some people read this story, critical, liberal scholars. But this is one of the reasons why they throw out the Bible in the Old Testament. Look at God. What an overreaction on God's part. I mean, the punishment doesn't even fit the crime. All they did was complain about the food in the lunchroom, and he's killing them? I mean, how could you serve a God like that? How could you just, just you know, think that this story is a good story? It's, I mean, come on. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Imagine if you were God. Imagine if you rescued the children of Israel from the hand of Pharaoh. Imagine if you sent those ten plagues to redeem 
the children of God. Imagine if you broke Pharaoh's will of iron, and then after Pharaoh finally let them go, still chases after your kids, and then you, when their back's up against the wall, God parts the Red Sea so that they might cross over in dry ground. And then on the other side, imagine you send them a, a pillar of cloud by day to guide them, and a pillar of fire by night. And then when they're hungry, you provide manna every single morning so that their bellies would be full. And then when they're thirsty, you provide water from a rock so that they might drink. And then when they say they want meat, you send quail to fly right about this high so they could just grab it and eat meat when they want to eat meat. Imagine if you've done all that and you're God and you've been so good to them and here they are being so ungrateful. And they begin to focus not on what they have but what on, the, on what they don't have. Do you see that? And they begin grumbling and they begin, they begin complaining and they begin rebelling against God. Now here's the problem. Well, before I tell you the correlation, let me tell you another story that I think is very, very similar. Remember in the Garden of Eden, God had given Adam and Eve paradise. And He said, you can have whatever you want here. You can enjoy yourself. Go crazy, except there's this one tree. Don't eat from that tree. But everything else, fair game. But then what happens? A serpent comes in. And what does the serpent do? The serpent begins to draw their attention, not on what they do have, but on what they don't have. Hey, you see that tree? How come you can't have that tree? Maybe God's holding out on you. Maybe God's not good. Maybe you can't really trust God. Maybe God doesn't have your best interest in mind. You know? Why don't you think about that? And right then, listen, a spiritual venom passed from the serpent into the very hearts and souls of all of mankind. And they were filled with an unwillingness to trust God. And on that very day, they drank the serpent's poison and they began to die. Now here's the correlation. Here's why God would send these kind of fiery serpents. When we as human beings begin to doubt God in this way, when we begin to grumble and complain against Him despite how good He's been to us, when we begin to doubt the goodness of God, and when we focus more on what we don't have than on what we do have, we too are filled with this venomous poison of the serpent. And if we don't fix this thing, we, we are left in a very critical state. Because without God, we're left with this insatiable thirst. Without God, we're left with this unquenchable thirst that we try to satisfy outside of God, but nothing ever satisfies. And no matter what you throw into that fire, it just gets burned up and you want more. Because without God, we die. Let me give you a quote from Tim Keller. Tim Keller says it this way. The reason God sent the serpents was to show them what's happening in their bodies is exactly what's happening in their souls. What's happening in their bodies is exactly what's happening in their souls. Do you see the significance there? I kind of collect stories that illustrate this point. And my collection's growing pretty large. You remember this guy, Boris Becker, a couple years ago, tennis star? Did you know that when he was at the very top of his tennis career, he was also simultaneously battling suicide? Listen to this quote. I had won Wimbledon twice before, once as the youngest player. I was rich. I had all the material possessions I needed. It's the old song of movie stars and pop stars who commit suicide. They have everything and yet they're so unhappy, I had no inner peace. What happened? He had everything he wanted, that he desired, but what happened was that without God in his life, he ingested the poison. And he became overcome with this insatiable thirst. And no matter what he accomplished, however great it was, it was still never good enough for him. I hear stories like this all the time. Stories of very successful people who find out when you get to the top, there's nothing here. It's not what I thought it would be. I still feel empty despite the fact that I worked my whole life to get here. Friends, the problem is the poison that you drink. The problem is that when you kick God out of your life, you drink this poison and nothing will ever quench your thirst. Because without God, you're going to be thirsty always. It doesn't matter. You're not going to be satisfied in your professional career without God in your life. You're not going to be satisfied in that marriage if you don't have God in the center of your marriage. You're not going to be satisfied with that job you got if you don't have God 
in your life? No matter how hard you try with anything, when you reject God, you drink the poison. And now it's like you're overcome with this insatiable thirst. You've got this raging fever. You're trying your best to do it your way, but nothing's working out. And you've got this all-consuming, unquenchable fire on the inside of you. And it will never be good enough. Nothing will ever be good enough. And eventually, it's going to eat you alive. <laughs> and some of us, if you're like me, are so stubborn that it takes a trial in our lives, God has to send something difficult into our lives to teach us this lesson. And the reason He sends it into my life is to wake me up to my folly and to save me from even greater consequences, maybe even for some of us eternally, eternal consequences for our way of being. And though these consequences are awful, they do help us see what's going on on the inside. And they help us realize, I've left God out, that's the problem, and I need to look to Him again for the remedy. And for some of us, these trials help us to turn back to God and repent and receive healing. Now with that in mind, let's go back to John chapter 3. What Jesus is saying right here to Nicodemus is this. Just as the children in the wilderness had rebelled against God and rebelled against God's authority, so too we all have rebelled against God and against His authority. And just as the children have been bitten by those poisonous, fiery serpents, in the same way, you and I have been bitten by Satan, who tempted us to sin, which we did willfully. But when we did, we ingested that poison and were sick with sin. And just as their wound was fatal, our wound is fatal. Friends, the soul that sins will surely die. I talk to some people and, you know, they don't believe in God. Well, I don't, it's not that I hate God. I just don't believe in God. I just don't, I don't really see any evidence for Him to, be, to, to exist. It's not, I don't have anything against Him. I say, okay, let me ask you this question. A lot of times, parents in this area, they pay for their kids to go to college. So let's say your parents did that. Let's imagine they paid for everything. You didn't even have to work. You go to college. And then on spring break, let's say you came home. And your parents weren't there, so you decided to throw a big party in their house. So there you are, carousing, and you're having all kinds of fun with your friends in their, their house. And let's say, around 10 o'clock at night, you get a knock at the door. It's your parents. Oh, what are you doing here, son? Oh, well, you know, I came home for spring break and decided to have this little party. Well, you've got to ask your parents. And, and let's say the, the kid looks at the parents and says, I don't know you. You're not my parents. I'll tell you what, you can sleep here for the night, but if you're not gone in the morning, I'm calling the cops. Friends, is that boy indifferent towards his parents? Well, what does it look like from the parent's perspective? It looks like hatred. Friends, if there is a God and He's created you, you owe Him everything. You're made to glorify Him. You can't just use His stuff and kick Him out of your life and act like everything's okay. You're just indifferent towards the concept of God. No, 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 no. You kicked Him out of your life. And one day you'll stand before God and there'll be a judgment. And some people actually tell me, you know, I don't mind the fact going to hell. I, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Some people say this. I say, you know, there's no reason for you to look forward to going to hell. You know why? There's not going to be any pleasure in hell. The pleasure you're experiencing right now from your sin is a gift from God. But it's a stolen gift. And He's going to take it back. You're not going to enjoy hell. Hell is going to be the pure, unadulterated wrath of God. You need to repent of your sin and trust Him. See, we are all like the children of the wilderness here. We, we all have rebelled against God. And listen, listen, because here's the good news. Here's the good news. Jesus is saying right here, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, just like that, so I will be lifted up for everyone to see and for everyone to look and for everyone to live, for everyone to turn back to. And everything the bronze serpent was for them, I am for you and so much more. Because on the cross, I will become everything that's killing you. I will become sin for you. And I will be like the bronze serpent. Bronze in the Bible is a symbol of judgment. The only thing bronze in the temple was the altar. It was because you had to meet with God's judgment before you went into the presence of God. The fact that the serpent is bronze is significant. It's because God is bringing His judgment. That's what happened on the cross. That's why it's possible for us to be saved. It's because Jesus endured the judgment of God. He's the bronze serpent. You know, um, 
Gold is significant. It means holiness. Silver, it means redemption. But bronze always refers to God's judgment. And right there on the cross, you know, remember one of the things Jesus says in the Gospel of John on the, on the cross is, I am thirsty? Why do you say that? He drank the poison for us. He took the punishment. He is the bronze serpent. For those who have ears to hear and for those who have eyes to see. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. How do we apply this to our hearts? Friends, I hope it's obvious. We are all sick with sin. There's only one medicine that can heal. It's the Gospel. On the cross, your Savior took all of your diseases and carried all of your sorrows. And on that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. And it's to that cross that we must all look and live. Look and live. Friends, that's the Gospel. There is life for a look at the crucified one. There is life at this moment for thee. Then look, sinner, look unto him and be saved, unto him who was nailed to the tree. Oh, why was he there as the bearer of sin, if on Jesus thy guilt was not laid? Oh, why from his side flowed the sin-cleansing blood, if his dying thy debt has not paid? Then take with rejoicing from Jesus at once the life everlasting he gives, and know with assurance thou never can die since Jesus thy righteousness lives. His anguish of soul on the cross hast thou seen? His cry of distress hast thou heard? Then why, if the terrors of wrath he endured, should pardon to thee be deferred? There is life in a look at the crucified one. There is life in this moment for thee. Then look, sinner, look at him and be saved. There is life at this moment for thee. I close with a story. Probably the greatest Baptist preacher that ever lived was named Charles Spurgeon. Before he ever knew the Lord, he was wandering. He was lost. And he began to uh, consider seeking after God. And one Sunday morning in a January, he decided he was going to go try to go to church. But it was so snowy and it was just so stormy that he couldn't even get to the church that he planned to go to. So he turned down this side alleyway and found this other church. You've probably never heard of the denomination. It was called a Primitive Methodist Church. So he goes in there. And it's so snowy, there's like 12 people in there. And even the preacher got snowed out. So some lay person was going to have to preach the message that morning. So some shoemaker, literally a shoemaker, was going to get up and preach the morning's message. And the text that Spurgeon said he preached from was Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Spurgeon said after he read the Bible, he started to preach. And he remembers exactly what this guy said. My dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. Now look and don't take a great deal of pains and ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It just says, look. Well, a man needn't, not, needn't go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool and yet you can still look. A man needn't be worth a thousand pounds a year to be able to look. Anyone can look. Even a child can look. But then the text says, look unto me. I, said he, many of ye are looking unto yourselves, but it is no use looking there. You'll never find any comfort in yourselves. Jesus Christ said, look unto me. Then the good man followed up his text by saying this. Look unto me. I'm sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me. I'm hanging on the cross. Look unto me. I'm dead and buried. Look unto me. I rise again. Look unto me. I ascend to heaven. Look unto me, I'm sitting at the Father's right hand. Oh, poor sinner, look unto me, look unto me. And then Spurgeon said he was sitting there with like the other 12 people. And he said, then the preacher looked right at him, knowing that he was kind of a stranger in the congregation. And he said, son, you look miserable. And Spurgeon said, I was taken back. I'm not used to being called out in the middle of the you know, service. It was a little bit embarrassing. But with his eyes fixed on me, that's what he said. Son, you look very miserable. And Spurgeon said, well, I did. I couldn't, I couldn't deny it. 
And he continued, this, the preacher said, and you'll always be miserable unless you obey this text. But if you obey me now, this moment, you will be saved. And after he said that, Spurgeon said, the light came on. The preacher then lifted up his hands and he started shouting as only a primitive Methodist minister could do. He said, young man, look unto Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but look and live. And Spurgeon said, I saw at once the way of salvation. Like as when the brazen serpent was lifted up, the people only looked and were healed. So it was with me. I had been planning on doing 50 things, but when I heard that word, look, what a charming word it seemed to me. I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and Spurgeon said, I could have almost looked my eyes away. Then and right there, the cloud was gone, and the darkness rolled away. There's life for a look at the crucified one. Unto him who was nailed on that tree, then look, sinner, look unto him and be saved. There's life in this moment for thee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before you. We close our eyes. And if we're really honest with you today, we would confess that we too find ourselves to be a lot like those children in the wilderness. You have given us life and breath and many good blessings, but we have been ungrateful. We complain. And we're rebellious. But today, Lord, I'm reminded of Your grace and Your mercy. And so today, I do not harden my heart when I hear Your voice. And today, as it was back then, I look to You with faith so that I might live. I look to You today with a renewed submission. I will no longer stiffen my neck to You. I will bow down. I will listen. I will look. And because of your word, because of your son, I will live. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me so great a salvation, so rich, so free. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.